Hi everyone, so I've gotten a lot of requests to do a morning forecast routine walkthrough and I honestly don't know how I'd even do that. I mean, I don't know. So the reason is for that is my routine isn't a routine. I don't even have a set number of items I look at. Literally some days I look at every possible value. I break down everything in the atmosphere. And some days I only need to look at one or two things to chase effectively. So. Instead of lying and going through a routine that doesn't exist, I'm going to spend a bit of time going over my 10 favorite things to look at for hunting supercells and tornadoes on the plains when it comes to weather models. Now these may be applicable to other areas, but I'm focusing mainly on the plains since that's what I forecast and chase. So with that said, let's dive right in. Okay, first thing I look at is reflectivity and updraft helicity. I like combining these. This is an obvious one. The key with reflectivity and updraft helicity model charts is to never take them literally, but take them seriously, especially when you average them out over multiple runs of the same model. Now this is a skill you have to really work at as you have to have an open mind to possibility and you have to know how to blend solutions together. You also have to take into account the limitations of models today. They're not going to be 100% accurate. They're not going to model the atmosphere 100% perfectly because they don't have one-to-one -one resolution. So when looking at reflectivity charts, you can't take these literally as they literally aren't showing you what a perfect representation of the atmosphere. What they do show you, what this reflectivity and updraft to list chart shows you is pretty good though. And you should take it seriously. Finally, a, a quick note on updraft to list the updraft holistic swaths, there are a recent trend amongst chasers to use these, get really excited about tornado potential when you see them. I can't go there. I can get behind their usage and at least determining storm mode. I'm not sold on extreme updraft holistic swaths, meaning tornadoes. That method has failed a lot. You see it on social media all the time. But if there are clearly defined streaks consistently over the same areas over multiple runs, that at least signifies local supercell potential is much higher in that area. I also look at model reflectivity maps mentally as a collection of 100 mile bubbles. By that I mean I know if I'm in the area of a storm and it's within 100 miles of me to the west, it can be pretty easy to get on that storm. So if there's a clustering of solutions with supercells in a specific area, I tend to let radar and satellite do the rest and keep things more general. One day we'll have a consistent way to tell right down to the county and town where storms are going to go, but today isn't that day. Second thing, dew points and wind barbs. I love these maps, they're important. I'm a huge person when it comes to dew points. They're one of the most important ingredients for severe storms on the plains. I'm going to treat this as if you are completely clueless on what constitutes dew, good dew points on the plains. For the lower plains, and I'm talking about the area from central Nebraska down to north Texas, you know this includes Kansas and Oklahoma, anything above 65 is considered pretty good. 70s are excellent. 60 to 65, workable, but not ideal. And anything below 60, you have to have a lot of caveats to make it work. Now, west on the higher plains, this is thinking like the Texas Panhandle, New Mexico, East Colorado, far west Kansas, Wyoming, west Nebraska. You don't need as much moisture to have greatness. Anything above 60 is really good out there. And 55 to 60 is pretty solid, especially if the shear is in place and it's not too hot. A couple of caveats there, but 55, 60 can work quite a bit. 50 to 55, it's conditionally workable, dependent on a few other factors, mainly those ones I just said. You need to have those lower LCLs in really good shear, and anything below 50, I'm pretty much checking out on the higher planes. Third thing, 500 millibar winds. These are the winds in the middle levels of the atmosphere. If you want good vented up drafts, you gotta have some good 500 millibar flow. Anything 30 to 35 knots, depending on the environmental conditions otherwise, probably gonna get you there. Anything over 40 is ideal, and my excitement personally peaks about 55 to 60. Anything above those though, and we're going to start seeing storm movement, so speeds, those forward speeds get unworkable because the winds are pushing storms along too quickly. So just keep that in mind. Also, the ideal direction of 500 millibar winds to me is west to west southwest. Okay, fourth thing, 850 millibar winds. You want big tornadoes? Then you need south to southeast 850 millibar winds at 30 knots or higher. 
the biggest tornado days on the plane. They happen with south to southeast winds at 850 millibars at 40 knots or higher. If these are present, I get really excited about tornado potential during a day. Now for that fifth metric, 700 millibar temperatures. The 700 millibar temperature is a key metric to determining cap strength on the plains and also how much existing storms may struggle to realize their full potential. On that, I mean, if a storm is struggling against the cap, even though it's still up, it's not going to act like a storm taking advantage of the full environment. So it's going to struggle. That's why in some environments you see some storms produce tornadoes, some don't. It could be because of that, the fact that some storms are still struggling with that cap and not fully taking advantage of ingredients. There's a lot of local variation, even in tornado outbreak scenarios. So just keep that in mind. The general rule on 700 millibar temps is that anything over 12 degrees Celsius is a pretty stout cap. 10 to 12 degrees is workable and perhaps idea. As you get temps too cool at 700 millibars, so anything below that 10 degrees Celsius, you could get too many storms if the forcing's you know, pretty reasonable. Now, I gotta issue a caveat here. There are many other ways to measure cap strength and they are more effective when they're all used together. But I tend to worry about the 700 layer a lot and given that I'm limiting myself to 10 model charts in this video, this is going to have to do. However, we're going to have a full video on the cap soon, so be on the lookout for that. Number six, ML Cape. I've talked about Cape a lot in multiple other videos. You can check those out on our channel. I got one from the SKU T videos. I got one from a Chase forecasting tutorial. So just search through for Cape. You're going to find them. ML Cape is a measurement of instability in the atmosphere. I personally favor ML Cape over all others because it's more representative of what a storm is actually ingesting parcel wise. There have been multiple times I've seen storms in a 6,000 SB Cape environment act like 2,000 Cape storms because ML Cape was actually down in that range. As with the rest of the values, let's pretend that none of what I just said made sense and let's explain it. Anything over 1,000 ml cape is conditionally favorable for severe weather in my opinion. You can get severe weather under 1,000 for sure, but we're talking about the plains. I think 1,000 is kind of the cutoff. I've seen plenty of tornadoes in low cape high shear environments, which tend to cluster in that 1,000 to 1,500 ml cape line. Cape is not a measurement of if storms will form, so keep that in mind. Or put another way, CAPE doesn't determine if your engine actually works, it's just the amount of fuel you can use if your engine can actually start. 2000 ml CAPE or higher is pretty supportive of big severe weather, with more extreme readings than that 3000-4000 ml CAPE and above, offering more potent environments which require less shear to make really, really spinny things happen. As a general rule, the less CAPE you have, the more shear you're going to need to get a storm to produce tornadoes and vice versa. If you have extreme cape, sometimes very weak shear can become very interesting in a hurry. Next up on our list, LCL heights. Now when it comes to tornadoes, you have to know if cloud bases are going to be low enough to make them happen. For instance, if you have an environment with extreme wind shear and ML cape at 3000, but your LCL heights are at 2,500, then you are almost certainly not going to get tornadoes. But you can expect some pretty amazing well-structured high base supercells. LCL heights, excuse me, LCL heights are another indice, which I think there is a happy medium to work for, with heights at 1,000 to 1,500 being the most ideal for storm chasing. Anything above 1,500 becomes a lot harder to get tornadoes and anything above 2,000 is basically saying tornadoes are unlikely. Tornadoes are more likely with LCLs below 1,000, but the chasing may not be as good. Now, typically low LCL environments are going to be characterized by faster moving, moderate instability, or lower storms. While there's something to be said about being guaranteed a tornado because as the LCL heights lower, your tornado odds do go up, these storms typically don't look as good for the camera and are usually a bit tougher to chase since you'll have to be closer to see the cloud bases of storms. I personally just happen to favor that happy medium if I had a choice. Okay, next up, zero to one kilometer SRH. This one stands for storm relative helicity. When looking for tornadoes, I tend to favor shear over instability on my depth chart. 
the first shared parameter I look at is zero to one kilometer SRH. Anything over 100 on this chart is considered favorable for tornadic supercells. Anything above 100 is good with increasingly good environments as you go up from there. There are no clear cutoffs when it comes to SRH though. So if all other factors appear very favorable, but the zero to one kilometer SRH is only 80, I wouldn't give up hope just yet. And number nine, zero to six kilometers shear. I look at the overall shear of an environment as well to determine if supercells are possible or not by looking at the zero to six kilometer shear value chart. This measures the change in wind from the surface to six kilometers up in the atmosphere. And the more you have, the more organized storms are going to be. For zero to six kilometer shear, anything above 30 knots, I consider pretty solid for supercells. My preferences are anything above 35 to 40 knots. The biggest tornado days see bulk shear in the 40 plus range, typically with the average of these big tornado days actually being closer to 50 knots. Keep that in mind. Last, number 10, supercell composite. I like this parameter a lot for determining if the environment is indeed highly supportive of supercells. Now, if you've already checked off all the other boxes above, you already know this is a supercell day. But this is a final shortcut solution to kind of digging into the atmosphere and perhaps seeing where all these ingredients line up on a single map a little quicker. Supercell composite takes into account effective storm relative felicity, MU cape, and the effective bulk wind difference, or more simply, two shear values and one instability value. There aren't huge cutoffs to when significant tornado events are more likely with supercell composite parameters. So just think generally, the bigger the value, the more likely big supercells are to happen. For instance, a supercell composite of 11 signifies an environment more supportive of severe weather than three. But this is largely dependent upon storm mode processes that you'd need to be paying attention to. So whew, that was a lot. There are of course many other options to look at when it comes to forecasting. I only gave 10, so do me a favor. Let me know if there's anything I didn't list you would favor more in the comments. We're all about sharing information here. Also, be sure to check us out on social media. Also, you should hit that subscribe button too. We'll see you next time.